QuickBooks Online 2024 Bank Rules. Same vendor, filter by amount. Get ready and some coffee because we get things done on schedule with QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty, to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our QuickBooks Online bank feed practice file we set up in a prior presentation, opening the major financial statement reports like we do every time. The report's on the left-hand side within the favorites. We're going to be right-clicking on that balance sheet to open a link in a new tab. Right-click the profit and loss, otherwise known as the income statement, opening link in new tab. Right-click in the trusty TB to do the same. If you don't have the trial balance in the favorites, you can search for it. Let's tab to the right, close up the hamburger, and then change the range. We're going from 010124 tab, 033124 tab on the months, so we can see that and run it. Let's tab to the right, close the ham boogie again, so we can boogie down with the range change. 010124 tab, 033124 tab, select in the drop down. We want the months and run it. One more time, tapping to the right, closing the hand boogie so we have more room on the dance floor to boogie. Going from 010124 tab, 033124 tab, selecting the drop down months, run it to refresh it. Okay, let's go back to the balance sheet. We've been thinking about, of course, our bank feed. Now looking at some more complex rules with regards to the bank feeds. So if we go back to the first tab, you will recall that basically when we set up the bank feeds, we went into the transactions tab and we went into the chart of accounts and we basically removed or made inactive, in other words, many accounts, including many of the expense accounts, so that as we add the bank feed information, we can assign it to specific accounts, creating those accounts as we go customizing our chart of accounts. That works great uh, and the rules work great as long as there's basically uh, defined payments that we're making to one vendor. But of course, when we have situations where we're trying to break out the payments to multiple accounts, multiple departments, or possibly we buy different things from the same vendor, then we get more complexity in terms of just trying to automate the system. I can't just say I want this one vendor going to this one account because if I buy equipment versus uh, supplies, then it's going to go to a different account. And you might also have a situation where you buy inventory, for example, versus supplies and whatnot. So that's what we'll deal with now. Some more complex rules with possibly more than one straight line item within them. If we go to the bank transactions, we've been creating rules of thus far, the rules on this tab, we want to create the rules as we go. The better the rules, the more automated we can make things. The easiest rules are for payments to like Verizon, which was the phone bill, for example, where we simply have one condition that needs to be met. If you see Verizon, that's who we pay for the phone company. Apply it to then this account based on whether or not the description or bank text contains Verizon. But this time, we're going to be saying that we might be buying supplies versus equipment. So we're going to set another rule for that. So let's go back to the bank transactions. And let's actually set up 
our our uh, items in Excel that we're going to imagine for our scenario. So I'm going to say this is the date. This is the amount. This is going to be the amount that flows through for the bank feeds description. And let's say on let's do it in February this time on two four uh, two. Uh, let's do it in March. We don't have as much. Oh three oh two and uh, 24 let's say the amount is 78 dollars for let's do home depot this time home depot would be the description and the bank feed text might have a bunch of jargon right within uh the bank feed and then let's say on three uh 8 24 we bought another 105 from home depot and then the bank jargon would be different right we're gonna have different bank jargon Du, 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 du. And then on 315 uh, 24, let's say we bought 2700 from Home Depot. And let's say du, 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 on the bank text. And then on 3 uh, 21 24, we bought another 307. A lot of sevens. Let's put a nine. I'm liking the seven from home home depot da, 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 da. and then on 3 uh 23 24 we bought 3600 from home depot all right so now the the the, the thing is here that we, we might imagine that the smaller things that we purchase from home depot are going to be supplies and I can say, hey, look, I'm just going to dump them into the supplies account. But the larger purchases might be those that we're going to have to put on the books as a fixed asset. And therefore, we might want a rule which at least limits those larger ones from being automatically posted so I can review them to see whether or not they should be put on there as an asset versus being put on there as an expense. So this would be a common rule and this is a common kind of procedure that we might do like from an audit standpoint looking through the supplies account to see if there were any large purchases uh, which possibly should have been on the books as an asset and then depreciated rather than just expense and this is one of those things you can't really get away from in the united states because of the income tax meaning the tax code will require you to capitalize certain things typically meaning putting them on the books as an asset and then depreciating them as opposed to just expensing them so we'll set a limit and say if it's over a certain limit now that limit's going to be arbitrary and may differ on based on the size of the company a larger company might have a larger dollar limit why because the the dollar amounts are going to be immaterial possibly for decision making under a certain threshold so in other words, the really the rule as to whether you should put something on the books as an asset versus expensing it is really whether or not it's going to have an impact on multiple periods into the future. But in practice, if it's going to if, if it's a minimal dollar amount, you would want to do the easiest thing typically would which would be typically just to expense it. If it's going to have a material impact, then on decision making we put it on the books as an asset. So let's save this. I'm going to say file, save, save it. And then do it. And then I'll save as and put it into here. Let's put it as a CSV file, a CSV. That's the type of file we can upload to QuickBooks CSV file. So we'll say, okay. And then we'll go into QuickBooks and let's bring this on in for our practice data into the checking account selecting the drop down upload from a file select the file and we want then this 665 which should be the number of the presentation we're on continue drop down into the checking account continue yes one column date format month month day day year 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 yeah 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 so we have the date date call description description bank amount amount looks good except that these should be negative notice i put them in there on the wrong way they should be negative now note i could go in and adjust it but i could also reverse it i could just say reverse it right here 
and then it makes it negative, which is cool. So I did that on purpose just to just to show you that. Let's add them all and then continue. And so five have been added. Mui B to the N. And so it has been it has been done. All right. So then we're going to go back on over. Let's say these are going to be on the transactions. We're going to say this is money out this time. And we're looking at these Home Depot ones particularly. So now I'm just going to simply make a rule that if it's over an arbitrary number, like $1,000, then we're not going to apply it to, we're going to have a different rule. So let's first think about the ones that are under a thousand, because that's probably the ones that we deal with more. If we go to Office Depot all the time for supplies, we're probably usually under under the rule that we're going to need to to increase it uh, to a fixed asset, maybe. So and then so I'm going to go into this one first and say, all right, this is Home Depot, and that will be the vendor, just like we normally do. We add the vendor. Now we might add a different vendor. You could add a different vendor for one that's under the threshold and one that's over so that you can break out uh, the, the things that are going to fall under uh, supplies versus fixed assets. Or you might just use one vendor for both of them. I'm going to use one vendor for both rules this time. So we'll say save it. It's going to go this time. It's going correctly, guessed correctly. Good job, QuickBooks, into supplies and materials. I'm not going to assign it to a class. And then we can make a rule for it. So the rule, there are rules here. Needs to, this is going to be for under, let's say, $1,000. 1000 This is the rule for it's, if it's under 1000 money out rule for the checking account. All conditions must be met, which is important because we will have more than one this time. We want the bank text as long as it contains Home Depot, just like normal. But then we'll add another rule, which will be an amount rule saying it has to be uh, less than less than one thousand dollars, less than one thousand dollars. Now, note that like if I say it has to be less than a thousand dollars here, and then next time I say that it has to be over $1,000, you might say, well, what would happen then if you made a purchase for exactly $1,000? Well, first of all, that's not likely, but I mean, it's possible. So, <laughs> so you, could, uh, you, you could make another rule, which, which was exactly for $1,000, or I, I believe the way QuickBooks does it is if two rules would be applied, the first rule that you make uh, is the one that QuickBooks is going to is going to take. So if you made this for for one thousand one, then and then you made uh, the next rule uh, that's going to be over a thousand dollars going to a different account for one thousand, then the ones that have overlap uh, will fall into the first rule that you made. I think that's how QuickBooks will work it. But I think we'll be okay there because there's you're probably not going to have a lot of purchases for exactly. 1000 so three of them have been applied so it looks like it's it's doing what it should be doing this is what it's going to do expense account supplies uh i'll leave that as is but i could say this should be home depot and okay let's save it and check it out it says something's wrong oh, you can't put a dollar sign in the rule name all right i guess is what they're thinking get rid of the dollar sign and then save it all right, I also got rid of the comma. I got rid of the comma and saved it. Okay, so then in here, it applied the rule out to these three, this one, this one, and this one. So if I was to automate the rules, I can then add these. I'm gonna say check, 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 and then add those in. So we'll say confirm. And then if I go to my balance sheet and we run it, then of course, within the checking account for March, we should have the decreases as is normally the case with the expense type forms for the Home Depots. There they are. The other side go into the supplies account. We're gonna go over here and then run it. And then on the supplies, we've got within March, there's our supplies that we have been purchasing from Home Depot. All right, let's go back. 
Now the point is it didn't apply the rule. So if I had automated this, it wouldn't have just like dumped these two larger purchases into supplies, which is an often place of error that people make, right? Because if you're doing your taxes, for example, and you can imagine if this was even a larger dollar amount, if it was like, you know, $10,000 or something like that, $30,000 that you paid to Office Depot, and then it pulls into your expense as an expense, it's going to look outsized, right? It's going to look off. So setting a rule for those kind of supply shops is, is fairly common. And then these larger purchases, we may, we may then want to discuss with our accountant to make sure that we're grouping our fixed assets in the proper type of grouping. We talked about that a little bit before, I believe. If we go to the balance sheet over here, uh, you will recall if we make large purchases, then they're going to have to be going into uh, a fixed asset type of account typically. And we want our fixed assets to be to be uh, tied out to the sub ledger, which, which will break out in detail, hopefully, the the assets that we actually purchased, not just grouping them as machinery and equipment, but saying we bought a forklift, we bought a computer, we bought whatever, whatever it is that we bought. And so that we can actually identify and then give the related uh, accumulated depreciation to it. So in order for that to happen, we probably want to be attaching the purchase detail possibly to the form that we are we're adding for large uh, purchases to make sure that it can be put on the sub ledger as cleanly as possible, most likely by the CPA or accountant at the end of the year within uh, the tax software. So that's why oftentimes you might not want to make a rule for the upper half that applies automatically. We might still make a rule for a suggestion, but maybe I wouldn't have it record automatically so I can at least check it and then possibly add as an attachment the purchasing documentation so that it will be there so when the when the accountant does the process at the end of the year they can see what was actually purchased in detail okay so that said we'll make another rule so this is going to be home depot again this time it's not going to go into supplies it's going to go into machinery and equipment the fixed asset account on the balance sheet and so let's and then we could add the attachment here to the file as we do this which would be great uh, but now I'm going to create a rule for it and I'm going to say this is Home Depot over 1000 and this is going to be a money out rule contains all description. I like to use the bank test text. Does it have Home Depot? That's the first condition. Second condition, it's going to be an amount condition this time less than or greater than greater than uh, and we'll say 1000. So we have that overlap between the one dollar right because if it was one thousand and one dollar we have we could have a purchase that falls under both rules that meets both rule conditions and in that case i think it'll default to the prior rule given the fact that we created it first i think is how it will work let's go ahead and test it two of them are being applied it's going to be an expense type of form not an expense account that's the form that will be used category machinery and equipment and asset account home depot and then down here like i said i would make sure not to confirm it because i would like to to double check the larger purchases most likely and then possibly again add if i could as a pdf attachment uh, to it the purchase forms so that my accountant has that at the end of the year oftentimes you might also have finance information when you purchase large large equipment and so one way that you might give that information to your tax preparer to do year end adjustments uh, would be to attach those forms uh, to the purchasing documentation. So let's check that out. Let's go ahead and save it. And so there we have it. So we can confirm these two. I'm going to confirm Roger that. And then if I go to the balance sheet, run it again. And we go into the check in account for March, then we have all those happening. These two are going to machinery and equipment. And if I go back, then the other side did not go to the income statement, but rather to the machinery and equipment. Now, again, when you give your file to 
an accountant at the end of the year to help you to prepare the taxes at the least and possibly help you with your financial statements, they can drill down on the machinery and equipment because they're going to have to put this on the books in order to do the taxes and record the depreciation expense. Normally, there's not a lot of information in here because we don't purchase a whole lot of machinery and equipment because by, by its nature, it's something that's going to last for a long period of time. So there shouldn't be a lot of detail in here. And then the accountant can look in here and say, okay, there's machinery and equipment. I can see it was bought from Home Depot. What I would really like to see is what was actually purchased. So if it was like a forklift or something, I can put the license plate number or whatever on it, the identification number on it. I can break out uh, between multiple things that were purchased. If we purchased you know, five different pieces of fixed assets, I would like to identify them separately. So if we go into this form, and we had added as an attachment that that documentation, then that should make the 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 whole depreciation kind of issue recording of the fixed assets easier on the accountant. And you can kind of do that as you go and, and, and reduce one of those kind of things that will most likely come up if you have a, a good tax preparer, which is they're going to ask you, could you give me the purchase documentation so I can properly put this on the fixed assets depreciation schedule rather than just putting it under a generic machinery and equipment was purchased on this date because if you put it on the books as a generic machinery and equipment was purchased it's going to be more difficult to identify later on when you dispose of different types of machinery and equipment right you can kind of figure it out you'd have to go back whenever five years to when you purchased it and see when you know <laughs> when you purchased it and what it was that you purchased maybe but that's not the way you want to do it. You want to, you want to put it on the books on the sub ledger so that you can identify what was purchased 10 years later when you dispose of it so you can properly take it off the books as well as the sub ledger. All right, so that's the general idea. If I go back to the first tab, we can of course track these rules within the rules over here. And we've been creating all of our rules. The better we get these uh, rules down, the easier it will be. And you can see this is rule number 12 versus rule number 13. Like I say, if one of the conditions of a transaction meet both the conditions of rule 12 and 13, I believe that QuickBooks will default to, to applying the first rule, which was in this case under uh, 1000. So in this case, if we had a transaction from Home Depot for $101, it would meet both conditions because this one we actually made a condition of of 1001 under 1001 or something so if it was a thousand dollars i should say then it would be meet both conditions and it would fall into this rule so that's one way you can you can deal with those overlap kind of situations uh, uh without having to make three rules right you don't need another rule possibly to say well what if it's exactly a thousand dollars Actually, I'm not sure if a 101 wouldn't meet both rules because this one was under 101 and this was over 1,000. But if there was a situation where it met both rules, then <laughs> then I think, I like I said, it'll, it'll apply the first one. So I think that's how it works. Anyway, let's go to the balance sheet. And uh, this is where we stand at this point in time. So just to check that out, if you're following along. And then here's the profit and loss. And so this is where we stand with the good old P and L. I think the easiest thing to check is the trial balance, which is basically the balance sheet on top of the income statement. If your numbers tie out to these numbers, great. If not, try changing the date. It's often a date range issue. And then you can drill down to the source document and change the date on the source document if you need to.